We welcome you again to our roundtable discussion of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <clears throat> uh, we are religion faculty from Brigham Young University. I'm Brent Topp, Associate Dean of Religious Education, and joining me today on our roundtable discussion are professors from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Professor Jeff Marsh, next to Brother Marsh is Professor Ray Huntington, and next to Brother Huntington is Professor Kelly Ogden. All of them are from the Department of Ancient Scripture. We finished up talking last time about that remarkable miracle on the Sea of Galilee as the, uh, the Savior walked on the water and invited Peter to uh, join him on the water and to come down. And what a remarkable act of faith and the testimony of that. Well, let's pick up a little bit there with Matthew 14, and then we're going to jump to John 6 to see how that then immediately goes into a, one of the most important teaching moments of the Savior's ministry. Kelly, what do you see in that last little episode out on the lake that sets the stage for what's going to take place uh, uh, over in Capernaum? Well, I'm impressed that Peter, he's a mortal, a regular mortal like the rest of us, he actually walked on water. He would remember that the rest of his life, of course, but when he saw the wind and the boisterous and all the distractions around, just like life, he started to sink. You know, when I think it, when he took his when he took his eyes off of Jesus, yeah, he started to sink. And so do we. When we take our focus off of the Savior, we're going to start sinking. But His arm is there to reach out to us and bring us right back up. No, I, I draw things. four principles from this story regarding that: walk in faith. You have to leave the ship occasionally. Focus on Christ. Don't focus on your fears and call out to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think these are great principles. We, we may not walk on water. That's not reality But there are other us. things in life. There's other things that might, exactly. by mortal perception, yeah. be just as Difficult. remarkable. We have our little fiery trials, as mm -hmm. Peter points out. You know, one thing I like before we leave this, uh, uh, the statement the Savior makes when he, he, he appears to his disciples on, on that ship, uh, and it's fairly quiet. It's, it seems to be uh, each of the Gospel authors are picking it up, and it's his pronouncement of, be of good cheer and don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. In and a that's time of great stress yeah. and turmoil. That's what the Savior wants us to hear. Look at verse uh, 21 of John chapter 6. Again, a, I think another <clears throat> typical little Hebrew understatement may be here, but it's a wonderful statement. After this remarkable miracle, and seeing Peter even do it, then I look at, look at verse 21. Then they willingly <laughs> received him into the ship. Oh, man, wouldn't they ever want to invite Happy him to have into you the here. ship? <laughs> and when, you, when we have seen that remarkable, when we see the remarkable goodness in our lives, shouldn't we also willingly receive him into yeah. our lives? I, I just love that phrase there. And so then at, at the end of verse 21, it says, And they immediately, the ship was at land, whither they went. Well, where were they going? They're going to Capernaum. Okay. Back home. All right. So now that sets the stage. Capernaum is Peter's hometown, as we know. They're uh, on the northeast uh, port, uh, northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, Brent, there's almost something, f it, it's almost humorous what happens. We're over in John 6 now. The people stood on the other side of the sea. They had seen that there was only one boat that went and that he went not with the disciples in but that boat. Coming back. When they got to the other side, they also took shipping, came to Capernaum, verse 24. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, verse 25, they said, Hey, how'd you get here? <laughs> <laughs> they were curious, and then he just leveled them yeah. with the statement, You seek me, not because you were, because you uh, saw, the miracles. saw the miracles, but you ate of the uh, loaves and were filled. But, you know, and the JST makes a very That's interesting yeah. observation there. Below. Go ahead, Ray, why don't you take it? I was going to say it? the JST adds, you're seeking me not because you desire to keep my sayings, mm -hmm. neither because you saw the miracles, yeah. but you want the because free you bread. did yeah. eat and you were filled. You want the free meal. We want refreshments. Yeah. Uh, and isn't that, that's a pretty stunning and stinging uh, indictment of them. But you know, when you understand some of those messianic expectations of the Jews at that time period, they, they envisioned this era of plenty when the Messiah came. Uh, no more work, no more labor, no more having to go out and till the ground. Um, the and earth would produce spont spontan <laughs> spontaneously. Uh, the fruit trees would give fruit all year. Fruit uh, trees that didn't bear fruit would begin bearing fruit. And th this is uh, this is a, a time where uh, they want him to continue the, the free meal. And then that, 
that becomes the springboard into his next discussion yeah. with them. You see, you look in verse 27, and I think it goes right along with what, you, what Ray just said about this messianic expectation of ushering in a golden era of prosperity and peace and, and plenty. And then he reminds them that his ministry is not for meat, not for food, but look who says that you labor for that which does not perish, does not corrupt, does not get wasted and thrown in a, in a dung heap, which labor for something else. Life. You know, think, think about our mortal lives. We might, in our minds, criticize them for seeking after the bread only when they've got the Savior there and the incredible miracles. But is it any different today? How much of our lives is focused on the temporal, temporary things of this mortal sphere? If we concentrated, he even said at one point that those who seek after money and provide for a retirement, if we gave half that enthusiasm to the things of the Spirit, right. we'd all have eternal life. A, a good Christian writer uh, of another denomination made a very interesting point on that. He says we have to have the temporal things. Right. But he calls them the tyranny of the urgence, mm -hmm. because they're urgent, we need them, and, and they end up becoming our tyrant. And that's what the Savior's saying here, is don't put your whole focus on, on meat and income and, and food in that way. Because now look what he's saying, is he sets that up by, in a way, rebuking them for what they're seeking and, and clarifying their messianic, the real messianic expectation, He's saying, the Son of Man hath power to give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now, that's a pretty strong declaration of who he is, and he's a different kind of Messiah than what they're expecting. Now, notice in the very next, in verse 30, then immediately, what is their, their reaction when he says to them, I am, I'm the Son of God, and if you'll believe in my works, you're going to be saved. Then what are they going to say? Well, you look in verse 30. About a saying. What sign showest thou, Dan? I mean, he made a bold statement here that he is God's son and that he's the one that's going to provide a spiritual meat for them, a yeah. spiritual food, no one else. And but don't you find the question rather odd? Especially the way oh, Kelly sure. started it out. They have just seen this remarkable miracle on the Passover week, as, as we're talking about there. They have seen the very things, and then, as Kelly pointed out, they have at least been seeing this miracle of the lake that he's in the boat now, and then they ask for a sign? I find that really intriguing. They they have had sign after sign after sign, and miracle after signs miracle. Does it take? Exactly, and then well, they ask for the sign. And they're not listening. Okay. He's, he's already said, you're, you're here because I filled you and you want more food. And, uh, and, and they're still on that, that notion, because uh, they're saying, uh, give us a sign. Verse 31, our fathers, our, our Israelitish fathers with Moses did eat manna in the, in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And that now, was is, for 40 in, years. Yeah, yeah and think of the implication sure. of what they're saying there is, well, Moses gave us a sign. Moses gave our fathers a sign. And it so, was food. And it was food. And so you're telling us yeah. not to seek for food. Can't you do well, something yeah. well, like Well, here's that? the sign. Okay. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness. They're, they're dead. dead. Yeah. I love that phrase. Now. In fact, I love that. Yeah. And uh, you know, where are they now? They're dead. And what I'm going to give you is a better sign than that.